uh, at a, essentially a, uh, a processing plant down in uh, Shakobad, this is Shakobad in Richmond today. And uh, um, Mr. Tucker uh, was from uh, Dinwiddie County, came from a rural background, Virginia, uh, grew up on a family farm. He came to Richmond, uh, like his brother, um, to, uh, to make a better life. And he, and he was doing well. He was supporting a son, teenage son, Abraham, back down on the family farm in Stony Creek, Virginia. And uh, again, during the question and answer, if you ask, some, some people read the book want to actually go to the cemetery that I described in the book, and I can give very easy directions off of I-95, but it's just south of Petersburg. So, uh, Bruce Tucker uh, was, um, celebrating the end of a work week on uh, March 24th, 1968. Uh, he was up on um, Church Hill with some of you in Richmond, which is where, where St. John's Church is. He was uh, sitting on a low wall, talking things over with his friends, uh, thinking, why, uh, had the misfortune of falling backwards off a low wall, <coughs> suffered a very severe head injury, was rushed down to uh, the emergency room at what was then the Medical College of Virginia. Um, for those of you who don't know, the terrain, I'm, I'm going to go uh, back and forth between MCD and today it's Virginia Commonwealth University or VCU Health. So he was rushed down to the emergency room. Uh, he was still speaking. He was agitated, but still speaking. So all his vital signs were, were okay. And uh, he was uh, taken into the hospital that night, and less than 24 hours, the transplant team at the Medical College of Virginia had removed life support, and without any knowledge by, of, of anything by, from his family, any awareness that he was there, uh, made the decision to remove his heart, and while they were at it, they took his kidneys too. And, um, Unfortunately, as a black man with a bit of alcohol in his breath, Bruce Tucker was considered, like many black Americans before him, uh, easy to exploit, easy to exploit, and an organ uh, supplier uh, at that point at the Medical College of Virginia, which was ready to do its first uh, heart transplant. So, Chris, and that, that in a nutshell is the book in Three minutes or so. I love it. <laughs> Benjamin, the subject of your book is a white family doctor who grew up in poverty and was a victim of intergenerational abuse, who ultimately murdered his elderly father, shocking his patients and the whole community. Tell us about Vince Gilmer and how you came to know him and why you decided to write a book about him in three minutes. In three minutes. <laughs> First, I have to say that if you haven't read The Organ of Thieves, which I, I started listening to early this morning, <laughs> as I neared Charlottesville, I wanted to just keep driving because it's so good. So, so you should definitely check it out. Um, so my book is about a character who's a real person. His name's Dr. Vince Gilmer. And Dr. Vince Gilmer it was a rural family physician outside of Asheville. Speak up a little bit about him. And he, in 2004, went to Broughton Hospital, Mental Hospital in North Carolina to pick up his father. And that evening while driving home, he killed him. Um, I learned about Ben Stilmer only because I helped to resurrect the clinic that he had built himself. And so it was news to me that there had been a, a, my predecessor was also named Dr. Gilmer, and that he had killed his father. And so naturally I became curious about who this other person was. And wanted to find out why this beloved physician um, became a, a committed this brutal act. And so I inherited his patients and inherited many, many stories about this, this incredible physician. And it didn't, there's so much dissonance about who I, the person that I knew through stories and the person that I read about in the newspapers. And so here started a quest that lasts, it's lasted a decade now to discover who this person was why his brain um, unraveled. I was curious about this as a previous neuroscientist before I went into practice. 
and wanted to understand what happened to him, and um, and then ultimately why he was put in prison. And ultimately, why did he represent himself for his own murder trial? Why did he never get an appropriate examination that, that might propose other reasons why he killed his father? He was, he was labeled as a malinger, that he was faking his symptoms. And so after visiting him once in prison, I learned that he was not a malinger. He was a very sick man. And it took very little time to come up with a diagnosis. I'm not going to tell you what that is in case you've ever read the book yet or heard the story that we told in This American Life back in 2013. Um, that was, I needed some help to pursue this. And so I asked Sarah Koenig, who did a serial, to, to help me. Um, and ultimately, this is a very personal story, a memoir about myself learning to be a fledgling, as a fledgling doctor, learning to be a doctor, and learning how to, to fight for justice. So Benjamin, the early section of your book revolved around your kind of fear of Vince Gilmore once you learned that you shared a name and that he was so highly thought of, but then you learned that he was also in prison for killing his father. So what, what do you think that was about? And sort of how did you get past that? Like, why did you ultimately spend the decade working to understand him? So we are all defined by preconceptions. And we're easily swayed. And I was easily swayed that, that he was a murderer. And I had been told by other patients, one patient in particular, that when he got out, that he was going to come after me. Seems sort of natural since I inherited his life, I inherited his, his life's work, his clinic, his patients as well. And so after I heard this patient telling me that he was probably going to come after me when he gets out of prison, it's, it triggered a few things. Um, my family wanted me to leave Asheville. Colleagues told me that you know, I should disappear for a while, which was kind of crazy at the time. But um, that was a prompt that either I had to dig a little bit deeper to figure out who he was if I wanted to stay in this clinic and, and continue my professional life there. So I, I sort of traversed the threshold where the, the paranoia and fear became an intense commitment, curiosity, or obsession to understand why this happens. And, and why I shouldn't be fearful anymore. Can you guys talk about why no one or, or not enough people advocated for either of the subjects of your book? Like, Chip, why, why did no one, I guess I would say no one to our knowledge or to, 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 from your reporting knowledge, um, tried to save Bruce Tucker's heart from being taken from him? Um, like, where was the care and concern for him and his family? Just to summarize, I think the word is power, you know, and you can look at any situation in your life today having problems with it. Uh, power often is the <laughs> problem, especially dealing with large institutions. Okay, so in the case of Bruce Tucker, um, and I know Ben will appreciate this because most physicians understand a lot about the history of medicine, <laughs> so I'm, I'm always um, I'm always a little bit shy to make pronouncements about the history of medicine around real MD. So you can help me overcome my fear and paranoia. But um, really, at that point, um, and I've heard other doctors tell me this, it was what what was known as the, the wild west of medical research, especially with heart transplants. And so when I say power. Wild West, what I mean is the physicians, the doctors inside of the Medical College of Virginia, they were in an international race to perform the first heart transplant. And one of the things you'll, you'll see in my book, uh, or if you read it up, uh, already, I actually started out thinking of the book purely as kind of like Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, The Race to the Moon, but The Race to the First Heart Transplant. And, um, and indeed, a lot of that is in the book. Um, this was an amazing medical research that went back well into the, you know, probably the early part of the 20th century, but in the 50s, it picked up a lot. And so you had a number of famous doctors who were involved in it. And two of them, or, or three of them are in my book, one, four actually, Dr. Lauer um, in, at MCD, who was recruited by David Hume, who was the top kidney transplant uh, specialists who started the transplant center 
at Medical College of Virginia, which is still there. Um, you had a gentleman named Dr. Norm Shumway at Stanford, where uh, Dr. Lauer, as a young uh, resident, was enabled by him to work in the basement of this leaky lab in Stanford, which was then the hospitals in downtown San Francisco. So you have all these characters that were really working hard to get what they wanted. And imagine surgeons have big egos. Imagine that. They should have big egos because they, they're doing a lot of important work. Benjamin mentioned ethics, or his, his book, Ethics, Medical Ethics, is a big part of my book. So what happened was, when Bruce Tucker was rolled into that emergency room on the night of May 24, 1968, I always say, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, especially, again, for an African-American male with alcohol in his breath. Because the assumption was that nobody cared about him. They made, you'll see how they made some very, um, I'll just use the word lame, attempts to contact his family. Um, if you're uh, mature enough like me to remember right after the assassination of Martin Luther King, this was a month later, the socio-political you know, environment was not in a place where anyone was going to help the Richmond police find a black man's family. So once they had made basically a um, just sort of a superficial attempt to find his family, prison, there were no internal controls at this point. There are now, by the way, in this book, if you happen to be in the transplant realm, it's not meant to deter anyone from being an organ donor. In fact, the opposite has happened. I'm happy to say that Northwestern University has used an NBC there did a series on race in Chicago where my book and I was interviewed for that on my website if you want to see it, um, which is chipjonesbooks.com. I'm going to say it once more. <laughs> you mentioned Twitter, but I, I, I saved a lot of those interviews. They're very interesting, and actually, actually, Kristen and I, as journalists, I've actually been very impressed. A lot of times, print journalists kind of put things in the side, put down. TV journals. Well, there's some really sharp people out there uh, doing stuff. So I'm glad that the injustice and the lack of oversight or any controls on that at that moment in time, it, it just, and it still, it, it, it stunned me when I first learned about it. And what I always say is the book went from my head to my heart because it started, excuse me, it started about this race, but it really was, was not killing me. Yeah. Now I'm going to start crying. <laughs> we all work on really sad books, um, but important. Both of your works are so important. Thank you for sharing that. I don't want to give away the ending, Benjamin, if you don't want to, but um, you, you mentioned that there were preconceptions about who Vince Gilmer was. And I mean, I, I thought it was so moving that you talked about how caring he was for his patients and how beloved he was, and that nobody could, you know, put together, could, could make, could work out in their mind how someone that they knew as such a loving family doctor, a caring member of their community, a, a really giving person could have, have gone transition from that person, or could have been the same person that killed his father in sort of a brutal way. Um, and not to give away what you found, but you did you did learn that there was a mental illness that explained this. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about like how his if you don't want to give away the diagnosis, it's fine, but talk about how it presents itself early and why no one would have noticed it and, and basically how no one ever came to advocate for him? Like, how no one before you figured out that there was something really wrong with him, and that's why he killed his father, and not because he was hiding some evil side his, his whole life. Yeah, there's um, so much well sounds of preconception and, and bias. And when Vince Gilmer was labeled to be a malingerer, that's what everyone believed he was. You know, we, we all try to enter, as physicians, we try to enter the exam room without preconception in our minds, but it's so hard. It's so hard to enter into any relationship without preconception or bias, because our brain often deceives us. And one of the characters in this book is, is the human brain. Um, 
those preconceptions deceived a lot of people, so it, it, they deceived everyone during the initial trial, during the arrest. Um, even during this, this psychological or forensic evaluation, um, that diagnosis of malingering just persisted for, for a long time, for uh, over a decade. Malingering is just Malingering, faking. Malingering means he was, he was thought to be faking these symptoms. And so, you know, once you have a label like that, it's, it's hard to get over it. Once you have a diagnosis yourself as a patient, it's, it's actually really hard to change that diagnosis. Even if you've seen a physician multiple times, or you've seen a judge, or you've seen a jury. Um, so that label was, was never changed. And because of it, people thought that he was a kind, sort of sociopathic type person. Um, and nobody asked. In the prison, nobody asked, I mean, how could you spend 10 years in a prison and never ask, why is this guy exhibiting these symptoms for so long? How can you, you keep that up for so long? Um, and so I, I was a, a, a fresh mind, I think, to take a look at him and to, to re-examine what had happened. And to, to think with a popular rasa, you know, what, what happened to his brain? Thankfully, there are other people within, within the prison system who were willing to begin to listen to, but it took a decade before that happened. Can you talk a little bit about the human brain and what, like, researching his life and uh, told you about the, um, the fallibility of the human brain or the, it's not the fallibility, what is it? The, it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the pillar concepts in this book is that we all share a fallible brain. Each of us does. I do, you do, we all do, and you know, there's a certain spectrum or resiliency or buffering capacity that we each share before we hit that moment. And that moment is very different for, for all of us. In the book, I describe my fallible, uh, well, I have many fallible moments, but one fallible moment that, that I came dangerously close to traversing that would change my life forever. I think for men, it's like getting to know him deeply, getting to know his family, friends, understanding who he was as a child, understanding his, his family in a, in a very complex way. They, it taught me that his fallibility was defined by many different things, in addition to this neurologic illness. And if you want to know more about it, Dr. Gilmer's neurologist is here today, who's been an amazing partner. So Vince's brain was defined, firstly, I think, by incredible intergenerational abuse. He was sexually abused by his father his whole life. Um, that defined him as a person. PTSD defined him as a person. Generalized anxiety disorder defined him as a person. Coming off of, precipitously off of an antidepressant medication called an SSRI can define you as a person. I see this in the clinic every day. The spectrum of ways that our brains become vulnerable or fallible are immense. He had four things that were contributing to his unraveling all at once. So it wasn't just this, this neurologic disease that was confirmed by genetic diagnosis. So it was a hundred percent certitude that he has this, this disease. That wasn't what made him kill his father. It was a constellation of things that contributed to his brain really going awry. But nobody asked the question. Nobody was curious to know what happened. And I, as a family doctor, that's sort of our niche where we're curious. Where by nature we're ridiculous actors. Chip, did you want to add something? I just wanted to tag on something Ben said about preconceptions. Because uh, the light bulb went off um, when he said that. Um, in terms of your question, um, Kristen, which you know, really gets to the Matter, why wasn't the man protected from having an institution? See, it was hard, and no one's approval, only on life support. Um, when, you, when you start talking about then preconceptions, it reminded me of like my own education by writing this book and sitting in places like this. I was in the Virginia Historical Society uh, that she talked celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant. And I was there with the archivist, Jerry Costi, who really helped me a lot from BCU, medical historian. And basically, you know, there was not one black person in the audience. And I know this is not a very diverse audience, so I'm not saying that to shame anybody, but 
it was just sort of, okay, here we are. And the weird thing was I sat there, like, it was 2018, right when I signed the contract with Simon Schuster, and Jody knew I was getting serious about the book. We're listening to the words that were being used about the, rep, the, the lawyer who represented the Tucker family, and his name was L. Douglas Wilder. Well, he later became the first black governor ever elected in the United States. <laughs> and they kept talking about him. And, and, and when I did interviews with, with older doctors or, or people related to them, there was this preconception that these were black people trying to get money out of the system. Just similar, there are certain parallels in a way, strange way, to all stories by the, with yours. You know, in a way, even though he was dead. And his heart had been taken from him, and his son didn't have a father anymore. His brother, who was looking for him, didn't have a brother. He was considered a millennial. Why was that? He was black. He didn't have any representation. And so preconceptions still go on today so much. And that's the positive part of my book is that it's being used in discussions at certainly at UCU and other uh, medical colleges, and also VCU made it their comic book profession this year. So every freshman has to stop through my pros. <laughs> but the good thing about that is not only as a writer, but as a human being, you know, definitely challenges everyone's biases. And, and, I, they, and VCU started the history and medicine program. So there, what you said about biases has been really also made to it because obviously if you're in the medical profession right now, or you're in the legal profession, uh, or any academic profession, financial, it doesn't matter. You're not talking about frequency biases and you know, not, not shaming people, but just talking about these things, then, well, you're probably a political partisan trying to make people feel guilty about talking about those things, right? So we'll, we'll come to that later, but it really has got to be part of any conversation in 2022. We, we are filled with stereotypes, preconceptions, and uh, speaking to the author of the great book about massive resistance and how Virginia had preconceptions about black students. I mean, to me, that links all three of our books. I was going to say, I would take it a step further um, in the theft of Bruce Tucker's heart and say it wasn't just ego or power that made them take his heart. It was white supremacy. Because there was the belief that white bodies, white people were more valuable than black bodies, black people, that they were superior. Did I hear you right that in 2012, you were in a some sort of medical setting at MCV? No, two, uh, 2018. In 2018, uh, Douglas Wilder, a former governor of Virginia, oh, yeah. was being referred to as someone who just represented the family for money? Pretty much. The operative word is, he, and this was repeated to me often, and I hope to be able to speak to writing classes uh, about word choices. He was so flamboyant. And, I mean, I can't tell you how many times. And then, and Richmond is a very well, diverse, diverse place, another very loaded word, I know. But um, it, it's just sometimes, and I'm sure it's like that around here, or any city. It's just like you going back into a time machine. And so the attitude is still among people um, of a certain age, usually, it was it was a scam that white people, white people were against white people to make them pay for someone who was going to die anyway. And you can argue clinically that he probably would have died, but you cannot argue ethically or morally in any way, shape, or form that, and legally, there's a law against taking Organs right away. You're supposed to wait 24 hours at that point. So there's no there's no way to rationalize it. But it, again, it's like you said, Kristen. I mean, frankly, just, just Kristen's got a great way of just cutting through the you know what. Well, you know, her point. Yeah. Yeah. White supremacy was very much part of the attitude, whether or not anyone was that sort of that they call it the velvet glove of Virginia. That's kind of attitude thing. And they try to they try to do it gently, and sometimes people still do. Obviously, try to do that. And I think the only way is to call it out for what it is. Can you explain just briefly, like, I mean, how amazing it, um, 
Douglas Wilder's defense of, and I guess it would be his case against um, the doctors and against Medical College of Virginia. Oh, yeah. Um, like, kind of how amazing his case was and, and the outcome. Yeah, really briefly, it was a four-year process, a civil trial. It was the first uh, lawsuit in the United States ever filed again, uh, around the heart transplant. So it basically uh, ground all heart transplants to a halt between um, around, around 1970, 70, well, probably 69, when he started filing the first day for a deposition. So, so Doug Wilder was a young uh, criminal uh, defense lawyer. and. Um, one of the things I learned in research for my book, even though I covered a lot of trials, I didn't know the chasm between being a criminal lawyer and a civil lawyer. And actually, I think in, in some ways, the Tucker family, though he, 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 was, he represented them very well, uh, they could have used, uh, they could have used help. And what happened was, this was a case that was too big to fail, as they say about banks now. And that's what Governor Wilder was kind of giving an on-record interview said. They were not going to lose his case. So it was basically a David Goliath uh, legal situation where he did his best to represent them, to do the depositions, to get the uh, court orders in at the right time. Um, but he was going up against the full faith and credit of the state of Virginia, which had the Attorney General's office uh, representing MCB as an institution. And then one of the first um, uh, medical malpractice lawyers in the country was in Richmond representing the two doctors for an insurance company. His name was Jack Russell, perfect name for aggressive lawyer. <laughs> and so between Jack Russell taking a bite out of the arguments and MCD, and, and I will say this, I was able to interview Judge Ted Marco, who became a circuit court judge, who was a young attorney general uh, assistant Attorney General, and he gave me blow by blow and kind of walked me through it. He was not critical of Doug Wilder at all. He said he did the best he could under the circumstances. And I also was able to interview one of the jurors in the book. And between them, we could see how um, basically he got outspent. Just like in, in we, I, I love reading court trial stories now, because you can see how things are going to go. You know, he's got the experts coming in. And what happened was David Hume uh, brought in, and the same week before the trial, he, he had these, like, first internet, I'm going to make this, make this thing up, it was something like the first symposium on, um, on uh, neuro something in Richmond. He brought in, including people from, from University of Virginia, brought in people from Harvard, Yale, yeah, like all the national experts. And they managed to sway the jury. They managed wow. to sway the And the judge, Judge Christian Compton, a fine judge, he finally allowed into the courtroom an argument that was not part of Virginia law then that they used that he was, quote, brain dead. And that was not in code of Virginia. Okay? So Tucker still did not get a hand because they got outdone. Oh, and, okay, I'll ask this question later. I need to back to, to Benjamin. Um, that's, that's crazy to me. Um, it, Benjamin, it's a little, like if you haven't read the book yet, it's a little bit confusing how Vince Gilmer could have gone from being this like beloved guy to a murderer. Can, can you talk a little bit about whether symptoms were um, visible like prior to, prior to the murder and how, why that might not have been picked up by his friends or wife or his own doctor? Yeah, it's interesting that so this um, this neurologic disease unfolds very slowly, very insidiously, just like any mental illnesses do. So in the beginning, it's not the beginning phases. I'm speaking to an expert on the ground here. In the beginning, it, it's not um, noticeable as a neurologic process. It's noticeable as a as a, as a mental illness, which can be expressed through anxiety, depression, impulsive thoughts, those kinds of things. So he was. You know, a lot of people thought he was having a midlife crisis at the time. Um, he had divorced his wife. He was going out more frequently to bars, doing things that he that weren't customary for him. Um, so that you know, it wasn't glaringly obvious. Nor was it glaringly obvious either to the the folks who examined him in Virginia. So this happened in North Carolina, but the body was found in Virginia, which is why he was tried in Virginia and now he had. 
uh, which is why he's in prison today in Marion. And you know, I'm, I'm never trying to point fingers towards the people who, you know, because they didn't make this diagnosis. It's not an easy diagnosis to make in the beginning. But it should have triggered some thoughts about being curious. It should have triggered some kind of systemic um, you know, examination of why his personality was changing at the time. But it was it was slowly evolving. So it really didn't surface until or like around the time that he and his wife divorced and he was going out alone kind of stuff. Like in your opinion, like it wasn't evident or visible to his friends and family. It was evident in small ways. Like he he used to love to contradance and so his dancing was was a little bit awkward. He was a little awkward on his feet, but not much different than a fifty year old going through midlife crisis. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying the time it should have triggered questions was after the murder, at least. Yes, when he was arrested, he was fully delusional. He even had seizures. He described himself that his mind was not working right. He was very clear and very descriptive about what he was experiencing, but curiously, he didn't explain them. He didn't explain his symptoms in medical terms. He, he explained them in, in very layman terms. So he didn't describe as you know, that he was having a seizure-like disorder. He described these jellyfish-like scenes in his brain. He described that he was hearing voices. He was described hearing voices telling him to kill his father. But those are not normal thoughts. Those are those are associated with you know with mental illness. Okay, that leads me to my next question. And this is going to be the final question before we take audience questions. So, thinking of what you guys want to ask. Um, <laughs> So I have a final question for both of you. Um, how do you think institutions did not serve both of these men, both, both Bruce Tucker and his family, and Dr. Ben Skilmer? Then I guess I want to ask, how common is the incarceration of the mentally ill? Um, sort, of, sort of how pervasive of a problem is this? Maybe you can tell us quickly like how this story Ended, or maybe you could save that for a question from the audience, but um, I, I just want people to know like what the outcome has been of all your work. Sure. So I, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I didn't know anything about mass incarceration after many years in graduate school, two fellowships, a residency, medical school, a master's degree. I didn't know anything about what people um, experience in prison. I didn't know that there were 800,000 people currently today with severe mental illness who are behind bars. I didn't know that 40% of, of all incarcerated people, up to 40% of all incarcerated people experience mental illness. I didn't know that there were 10 times more people, mentally ill people, behind bars than in mental hospitals. 10 times. So this was this has been a new experience for me, the discovery of, of the system, the discovery of what it what it takes to get someone out. Um, you know, it, we during this process had to um, bow to two different governors of Virginia to try to get Doug Gilmer out. We had to battle a system, referring to the system, a system that is committed to not getting people out of prison, a system that is not committed to diagnosing their incarcerated people. And so the, the system works against that. And I was kind of baffled because I thought, oh, this is going to be easy to get someone out of prison who has a diagnosis, a confirmed diagnosis. You know, when we have an a undifferentiated cancer patient, we're trying to figure out what to do with them. Do they need chemo? Do they need surgery? We have uh, interprofessional chemo people that get together in a room to talk about it, to figure out what the best course is. When he was getting ready to spend a life in prison, he had just a handful or less than that of people who, who weighed in on what his prognosis was, what his diagnosis was, really just one person. During his trial, there was there was not an expert witness on his behalf, which is insane. So I tried to strap on my medical lens to see through this process and the two systems just don't, they don't match. You know, our, our goal is to heal people. The, our carceral system's goal is to punish people, and so those, those are not connected in a meaningful way, and that's, that's in part what the book, what I tried to do in the book, is to connect those two things that we, we have to see 
the problem, the systemic institutional problem, um, through, through a, a clinical lens, in order to heal crime from such a question. And what, what is his status now? So his status after two rejections by two different governors. Both Democratic and, governors, correct? Chair McAuliffe and Ralph Northam both rejected our chemistry position in 2017. When that rejection came through, I became committed to writing this book. Because I was mad. Very mad. And um, in just this past summer, actually, Governor Northam rejected our clemency appeal, which was very surprising to us. We, we thought that a neurologist would be able to start seeing this problem differently. We were, we were wrong. We thought that the stars had lined up to have a neurologist as a governor. It was a miracle. Truly, it was a miracle. For us, it was. I rejoiced. Um, but he said no. So strangely, during the last week of his governorship, he reversed, in, un in an unprecedented fashion, he reversed his own position. I like to think it was because I gave a book to everybody in this cabinet, <laughs> including himself. I don't know if that's true or not, but we also had an amazing legal team. Um, who is from Charlottesville, Jerry, are you here? Jerry. Jerry's the captain of the legal ship. And um, yeah, on his last day, he agreed to set him free. But he's not free. He's still in prison today, which is hard to imagine. A free person in prison because we have to find him a hospital, which was part of our, our clemency petition, to find a secure hospital where you could be treated for the first time. And so it's very hard. Can you imagine it's, that we have not found a place for him yet? It's very, very hard to find a, um, a clinical setting. So if you know anybody, please, <laughs> we are up for suggestions. Thank you. Um, Chip, how did VCU specifically fail Bruce Tucker, and what have they done to make amends? Have they, have they made any sort of um, apology for their role in his death, or uh, done, spoken directly to the family, or is there anything they've done to show remorse to their actions in this story? I would say the brief answer is no. There's no apology. I would also say that I hope that there'll be a thaw in this, uh, this fall when the entire freshman class reads the book, um, and a lot of professors bring it up. Um, I also know for a fact, um, and I didn't know this for a long time because I, I don't believe much of what I read in the papers that comes from public relations departments because I've read public relations. I also know that the, the, the uh, BC did try to get in touch with um, Abraham Tucker, who's his son, who's in his mid-60s, living on the family farm still, and we'll meet Abraham if you read the book or if you read it. And um, I can tell um, you that and this is a, a deeper, you know, conversation about the role of a, of a journalist versus the role of an author. Um, I tried not to play sort of the, the white guy trying to rescue the black family, the white knight kind of thing or whatever. I also tried to be more respectful in the reporter, no offense, Kristen, but we go after the stories uh, no matter what, and then you try to figure out how to handle it later. And I, I really did learn a lot about writing and, and sort of creating nonfiction uh, working on this book. Because I realized I was not going to be trying to dictate an outcome to the Tucker family. Yeah. Um, and so today, I can tell you that uh, through my cousin, I had a conversation with Abraham Tucker a few weeks ago, and um, which was really amazing, and just because he was willing to talk to me. And, and it was a real gift when I thought about talking with you guys today. It was one word. It was a gift to me because I mean I would have been happy just to talk to him to say that he really hated the book and please leave him alone. I would have at least known how he felt. But he actually told me, you know, he was very, you know, nice guy and he said, look, man, you know, I can see your passion for the story. He says, I, I learned a lot from it. He was just a teenager then, so he actually learned his family's own story in a way, or parts of it, from reading the book. He, he didn't want to be part of it uh, when I was working on it. Um, 
But I asked him flat out, and I actually asked him like to share this with audiences like you um, to respect you know, his privacy. Um, and he said it's okay. And I asked him, because you guys see this, Chris, in several times uh, in front of audiences, um, where is the apology? Um, and uh, I've been told by some uh, top political leaders uh, I won't name in Virginia that unless the Tucker family requests an apology, you think about this, <laughs> um, there won't be one. It's like kind of, what's that book by Joyce Teller in 2010? Um, so, but, but what, what Abraham said to me was, look, he said, he said, I've seen the world and I don't think much of it. And I said, so you're a private person. I said, yes. He said, I said, you want an apology? Do you want financial compensation, reparations? Um, he said, no, I don't, I'm not seeking that. And so, um, I still, and you, Chris has asked so many good questions about this book, and I really mean that. Um, she's kind of like pushed me to say, you know, yeah, there should be an apology. Because um, when you're a reporter, you really try to maintain objectivity. Um, so I've written, I, you can see it on my website, I've written columns about it. I've said they should dig up the plaque that's outside of the West Hospital, the MCV. It's still there. You can try to cross the state capitol. There are good maps in my book, incidentally. My wife, Debbie, is here and encourages maps. <laughs> so you can take two of the maps and do a, a walking tour and see these things. And right in front of what used to be MCD Hospital is a plaque that honors this, this great moment. But guess whose name is on it? Not only Bruce Tucker's name on it, but the recipient, the white businessman who got it and died seven, eight days later, Joseph Clett. His name's not on either. So both the donor and the recipient are left out of the story. So I'm hoping that being a pain in the butt as the boards are supposed to be, uh, maybe that'll maybe that'll change. Thank you guys. I'm so moved by the tone of both of your stories. <laughs> and we welcome your questions now. Um, are we gonna do a microphone? Yes. Okay, we've got a microphone coming around. We'll start with you here. Skipper, a second to get the microphone to you. Thank you. Amazing story. The question is for Chip. I'm, I'm really curious about your title, the book title. Whether that was yours or your editors, I know that there's a big thing in the, the industry in terms of who has control of the title or who suggests it. But, but part of what the follow-up to that question is that it's a strong title. It's an accusation. You call it the medical community, and in particular the two doctors, thieves. Mm -hmm. So to what extent was there pushback? Or is there, has there been pushback from the medical community, the physicians, or physician standings, or even the medical school? Well, once again, I'm just repeating it. No pushback. Wait, hold on a second. I'm just repeating the question. Sure. Sorry. Um, so the question was, for Chip Jones, the title. Is it, was it your idea, or where did that book title come from? Someone in um, editorial. And um, has there been pushed back to what could be viewed as an accusation in the use of the word thieves? No comment, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> a long day, you know, this is my first COVID test ever. <laughs> Thank goodness my daughter was here to help me do it. So for those of you who are working on books, and I hope there are books, uh, and maybe and you, maybe other people, uh, I was just telling Ben when we're sitting here making small talk, two things you have very little, you, you may have very little control over, let's put it that way. I mean, John Grisham probably has control over, he's, he's in town, right? He's <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but with this book, um, very little control over the title. The working title was The Stolen Heart. So I think we can have some interesting discussions in the English classes and philosophy classes about the difference between stealing and being a thief. Um, it is a strong title. It was not my title, and that's truth, to be a straight story. Um, there's thousands of books published every year, as you know. So when you work with, and, and the woman who's the publisher of Simon Schuster Gallery Books was very adamant about. I, we worked on every. It was like 
uh, greatest sense of heart songs. I went all through the 60s and did songs about the heart, but they didn't work. Just um, uh, Heartless was the, also the working title. So we get into, we, that gets into the behavior exhibited towards tuppers, which I like. What was the problem with that? Oh, too much like a romance song. So these are the ridiculous discussions you can look forward to if you're like me, a midless author and you're not John Grisham. It's the same with the covers. Uh, we prefer the hardback cover, which Kristen very kindly is showing. The paperback cover is very in your face. Guilty as charged. Please don't serve any papers in the <laughs> So I work with MCD. I was hired at MCD. Well, I worked at MCD. I was hired there in 1975. I knew Dr. Lau. And at first thought I would tell you, without a doubt, that MCD was a bastion of racism. Was what? A, a, a bastion of racism. They had a separate hospital for black people. In 75. Was it St. Philip? No, it was East Hospital. East West. Oh, East. Oh, gotcha. And, and, and it, was, it was Richmond. And I grew up there. I know exactly what you're saying is true about the arrogance. And I knew Dr. Longhorn, and my mom, I just run away by the story because he was the kind of guy, at least when I was there, I was the low person. Mm -hmm. I did life support. And so, and he knew me, and he called me by name, and he saw me in the elevator. He was probably the nicest guy in the world. I thought he was the nicest guy. How many doctors know you by first name in Europe? He know. And he was like, what? I just thought, wow, well, he's a superstar. He knows my name. So, just kind of, it's such a, a mind blowing. So, I'm wondering, because I still think, I still want to think, he was such a nice guy, you know? Sure. But, did he ever say a word about any regrets or remorse or, or, or he, responsibility? He did. He did. He did. <laughs> so the question is, did Dr. Lauer, um, one of the main doctors in the organization, did, did he express any remorse? Okay. So I'll say two things to answer your question. First part of your question about was he a nice guy? Yes, he was. Was he a great doctor? Yes, he was. Did he save a lot of people? Yes, he did. And you'll see in my book, that's part of the tension I explore between why did he get pushed by Dr. Hume to jump on board? And the reason was because they lost the heart transplant phase to Christian Barnard who studied under them the year before. That's my, that's my thesis. I think mean, it was professional competition and Dr. Lauer had been very cautious about doing anything to that point. Okay, so um, as to um, whether he expressed remorse, you know, I wish I could have interviewed him. I interviewed his wife, um, and she I don't think she shared any remorse on his part. But one of the things that's very interesting to me, and it is interesting, was how Dr. Lauer, to the end of the trial, which was a civil trial, not a criminal trial, so he wasn't going to go to the institutions of Virginia for this. It was not a criminal charge. He kept referring to it as, as, a, as a crime himself. And he somehow, he's a brilliant man. He's one of the greatest heart surgeons in American history. For some reason, the way he internalized it was that I'm, my, basically, I'm one step away from jail. And I don't know why he did that. I don't know if it was any sense of guilt. It might not have been. It's purely speculative. I, I, I tried in my book, as you'll see, to not speculate not too much, but give enough for the reader to make your own informed decisions. But I always found that one thing interesting. He kept saying it, it, was, it was one thing, but it really wasn't legally. But he kept holding on to that. And when he got, when, when, the, when the Tucker family lost, he was victorious. And he called up Dr. Shumway in Stanford and said, we won, you know, so. Just for the record, nice guys can also be racist. Yeah. yeah. One over here. Sorry, she's coming with the microphone. Hi, 
if you're not a, a doctor. Um, I confronted that detective years later, or just a, a couple of years ago while I was writing the book, and you know, he, he still believes that he's faking his symptoms. He still believes that he should be behind bars. But he was able to start a new conversation that the police or so law agencies can't solve this problem. Doctors can't solve this problem. And, and he was one who said, you know, we can only do this together. I'm just noting that a layman got this, a non-doctor got this diagnosis rolling, right? Am I, am I correct in that assumption? Well, his observations got the, the ball rolling. Yeah. But he was also evaluated by a forensic psychologist who, who um, is currently high up in the system in Tennessee, and I had a conversation with him too, and he, he now agrees that this was a travesty what happened. Thank you both. So, oh, you want to do one more? Oh, there was one. Okay, let me catch this last one. Oh, actually, there's two. Shoot. <laughs> Maybe we can go just a few more minutes. Um, okay. So, what I really appreciate about both of these books is I feel like it's sort of pointing out where these institutions have kind of failed to recognize the humanity of the individuals. And Dr. Gilmore, you talked about, or Gilmore, sorry, you talked about kind of coming from neurology into family practice, which is in the kind of human and intimate space, I feel like. How did that transition sort of change you and your frame of reference? And I'm curious for Mr. Jones as well, whether you had a similar kind of uh, evolution as journalists. Um, so the question is pointing out where institutions failed. Um, I think the question is, for you going into family practice, how, did I miss that? I'm not sure exactly what the question was. How, how that impacted you from neurology? I love that question. Thank you. I was as guilty as any of these people. I was as guilty as the detective. I was as guilty as the, as the jury. My preconception was that he had traumatic brain injury from a car accident. And because my master's thesis was on the you know, brain injury, cell neur neurons trying to survive, that was my first bias. And, but family medicine has taught me a lot about being less intellectual and more heart-centered. And if you're heart-centered, you become curious. And that, that opens you up to inquiry. And that, that's really what inspired me to ask the next question. But I, I was stuck on this other diagnosis for so long, even after speaking to Woody Guthrie's granddaughter, who's who, Woody Guthrie, who had this diagnosis, I had a conversation with her in my backyard, and she screamed this diagnosis at me a long time before it was made. And I, I didn't even notice it because I was stuck in this other rather headspace of, of traumatic brain injury. Did you want to take that real quick? Um, yeah, so, so thank you for that observation for the question. Um, Basically, I learned about the notion of historical trauma uh, that medical practitioners should know, know about and teach about today in populations such as the COVID uh, you know, vaccine resistance in communities of color all throughout the pandemic and people have been talking to me about that all through on COVID, on uh, Zoom calls and everything. The suspicion that still remains between the black communities and also in other communities. Um, so yes, um, basically, I, I, when I say I had to shift gears as a reporter to a writer and using, using Benjamin's um, notion of trauma, I can refer to me as like, I didn't want to re-traumatize um, Abraham Tucker. Um, I felt like I had to make an effort to talk to him, and that's why I present the book. So that's what I learned um, on a project like this, and you're working on projects, um, you know, it's, it's a mix of the head and the heart. I mean, you, you, you have to mix your you know, skills you might develop as an academic or as a journalist, but then you have to be able to step back from them. And, you know, even though publishers might give you, you know, learned titles, um, you have to uh, be true to what, you're, what you've learned and what you think is you know, the right treatment of the people being written about. Okay, we'll take that last question here. It's going to be a hard stop after this. But of course, they're going to be hanging around signing books, so <laughs> they can answer your questions while they're signing the book. Happily, happily signing books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a quick comment and one question. Um, 
I'm an attorney and I've worked pro bono for over a decade with prisoners. Um, and I spend the most fulfilling work I've done. And um, I've noticed that people of all, almost to depression, if people I talk to about that work, they might initially be resistant, like, well, why are you helping that? You know, once they hear their stories and, and they can humanize a particular prisoner or a handful of prisoners, their, even their political or their kind of um, ideas of what we can do to approach the problems often change. So thank you because what you're doing, I think, is the most important part, just talking about it and reminding people of the humanity of these people. Huh. And then my question, I guess, would be, you know, working in this space, the problems can, the challenges can seem so overwhelming. You know, the political will, um, you know, there's not a great incentive <laughs> for politicians to, to lobby for these people or for others, and, you know, money, and so many big challenges. Um, you just mentioned loading the fruit. If you could tick off a couple of those, it might be nice for us to and here I remember like, okay, what are some of the more tangible, smaller things you could maybe do to tackle some of these issues? So the question is, what are some of the smaller, more tangible things we can do to um, address the prison prisoner population that is, I think she means the mentally ill that are in prison? So first, I think you could point out the stories like change hearts. Intellectualization doesn't often change minds nor hearts, but stories that change hearts. And this was one story that kind of illustrated for me what low-hanging fruit could look like. But there are many things across the country, many programs um, that are doing incredible things in terms of trying to change how people are labeled, how people are, are locked up. But one, one experience that happened to me recently, this past July 4th, we had a, a mentally ill man that was, was banging um, um, rocks against our car. Then in the car, and I ran up to him and said, hey, what's going on? He said, oh, well, um, I thought there was a police officer in your car before I'm going to destroy it. And I asked him to sit down quietly. The police, a real police officer showed up and asked me if I wanted to press charges. I said, absolutely not. This is kind of a doctor. Um, and then I, we got him one instead of locking him up that night. And I asked the officer, what? How many more of these people are going to see tonight? I said, at least 25. This is just the beginning. And I said, well, what would it be like for you? If you had a social worker in your car, or maybe even a doctor in your car. And he said, I would be, I would be like Captain America. <laughs> and, and that's just one example of how if we can get out of our silos a little bit. And, and there are programs all over the country that are doing this. Like, we're starting to talk about putting our psychiatry residents and have them integrate with the law enforcement agencies um, so that they can, they can be evaluated clinically before they're seen you know, by a judge. But there are really many examples. This book isn't so prescriptive per se about all those things. It's more about um, a call to action. We can, we can all be, we all have to be curious and ask the questions. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you all. Thank you. 